Modern light rendering is complex, and as ray tracing becomes more viable in real time, we're seeing games simulate how the human eye actually responds to light in the physical world. Back in the time of the PlayStation, though, it was much more primitive, and it's easier to describe what it could do rather than a list of things that it couldn't. Models could be flat shaded or garo shaded. Flat shading is that classic flat look people associate with old CG, but really it was only Sega's hardware that used quad based rendering in the console market. It was far more common for polygons to be garo shaded, which interpolates the colors of the surface normal at the vertex. This technique is more or less interchangeable with the concept behind smooth shading or vertex coloring. Most games at the time used a combination of textures with vertex coloring. Vertex coloring works better on higher poly models, and if you look at lower poly models like those from Final Fantasy VII, you can notice that iconic shimmering effect. Programmers could attenuate the colors to simulate objects entering shadow, point lights, and even animated lights. Spyro the Dragon used shifting vertex colors on a transparent plane for Spyro's shadow, and the effect is pretty convincing. Silent Hill used it for the flashlight, and that's why the lighting looks so good for a console not capable of true lights. Vagrant Story actually doubled up on the models to simulate rim lighting and highlights. This technique is called inverted hull, and was used to create the black outlines in cell shaded games like Jet Set Radio. The fact Square was able to manage this on aging hardware is truly astonishing, and few if any PlayStation games look as good as Vagrant Story. Texture size was extremely limited for the time, and the larger the texture, the fewer the colors. Textured polygons were also slower to render than untextured polygons, so the denser a scene, the more economic you had to be to render everything at playable speeds. Some games mixed and matched textured polygons with untextured, and you can see this used to great effect in Crash Bandicoot, which is a very visually dense game. While baking lighting information is very common today, it was practically unfeasible on the PlayStation. Textures were restricted to 256 square pixels at 4 bits, that's 16 colors total at the largest size, so engineers were more concerned about tiling and reusing as much texture information as possible. Xenogears is notable for baking the lights into the texture, but its maps are small and it's very much an exception. The result, though, is a very rich looking game, Square once again outclassing everyone else with some of the prettiest texture work on the console. In the 21st century, many of these limitations aren't necessary, but good lighting goes a long way to making your lo fi art appear believably authentic. First off, always smooth shade. Unless you're making a Sega Saturn style game, few 3D games were purely flat shaded. Next, my render pipeline allows the use of vertex lighting instead of per pixel lighting, which is what modern games use. When shading with vertices, you have to pay attention to the detail of the scene. The more geometry, the smoother the interpolation. I bake static objects to a 256 square light map. This isn't authentic, but I find it creates an effect that's both dynamic while still being convincing enough that it could be possible. I find making throwback art is less about authenticity and more about believability. Shovel Knight is doing things the NES flat out could not, but it's believable enough to look like a game you remembered playing 30 years ago, and that's my approach to my work. Lastly, I set up light probes, which apply baked information to dynamic objects. And this is why I baked my lights in the first place, instead of relying exclusively on vertex colors. It's much easier to let probes apply shading than figure out how to get the raw color from the mesh, something I, like, I, I just don't even know how to do, really. The effect is convincing, and that's all that matters to me. For this misty forest scene, I struggled a bit with a shadow blocker, that's a transparent mesh that contributes only shadows, but I think my lighting settings are just too low to produce any decent results. I eventually realized I could achieve a more believable effect by using many area lights to simulate tree cover, and the effect is pretty good. I like using emissive maps to simulate specular highlights. Neither emissive maps nor specular highlights were possible on the platform, but the effect it gives this creak, the way it kind of glows in the dark and catches the moonlight, it looks real nice. Lighting is both my favorite and least favorite part of the artistic process. I have no practical knowledge on proper lighting, it's, I just have a general idea about how a scene should look in my mind. The actual process of lighting a map is very much trial and error, and you can see me here just constantly pressing the generate lights button, move a light a little to the left, move a light a little to the right, press generate, etc. If you're working on a 32-bit style game, I recommend smooth shading, vertex colors, and low-resolution light maps.